Summerland before hitting up the fall there and then Princeton. And it looks like we got a bridge, but here we are. And uh, the unique thing about that is uh, here we are out of the 350 miles of Kettle Valley Line. The train now only runs in Summerland, or is never proposed to run in the first place. Many thought this railway should never have been built. There were no long river valleys or canyons to follow. BC's mountain ranges run north and south, and the Kettle Valley had to go through them, not around them. To connect with the CPR's main line on the Fraser River it was a very costly venture. The KVR has been described as the most difficult and expensive railway line per kilometer or per mile to be built in the world. And the engineer they picked to build this, Andrew McCullough, is a very, very interesting character. And he really comes across as someone who would like a challenge. And that made him really interested in doing something like this. Randy Manuel is director of Penticton's R.N. Atkinson Museum. Kettle Valley Railway, probably one of the last of the great railways in British Columbia, or even Canada, really, that is built entirely by the sweat of horses and men. Back in 1912, 13, and 14, this section of the line and, and another part further up had thousands of men working here with mules and horses. Workmen were hard to find. Recruiters had to offer high wages. The gentlemen working on these railroads, and most of them were from Eastern Canada, there were no Chinese working on this railroad, were paid $2.50 a day. They got a free pair of boots, and that was really an incentive to, to bring the Ontario people out. But certainly, it was, uh, it was a rough life, but it was good wages in, in retrospect to what other people were uh, making in those days. For their money, they blasted their way through the rock, holding steel drills against the granite and pounding in holes for explosives with sledgehammers. In the process, they encountered some unusual perils. They drilled by hand. After hand drilling, they would fill the holes with either dynamite, black powder, or nitroglycerin, and then let the charge blow the whole mountainside away. After the dust had cleared, they would move in, and amongst the hazards of other loose falling rock would be heaps of rattlesnakes that had been disturbed from their dens when the blasting had occurred. And in the cold weather, people used to warm up the dynamite in frying pans um, so that it would explode consistently. And if you overheated uh, the dynamite, you lost uh, the frying pan, the fire, and everybody around it. At the time, the mountainsides all along the route, from the Kootenays to Hope at the head of the Fraser Valley, were thickly forested. For the construction gangs, the trees were just another obstacle, and the Kettle Valley had lots of them. The obstacles with the trees, of course, were the fact that we're working in an era with no chainsaws. And every one of these trees, millions of board feet, all have to be cut down by hand, and then cut up into reasonable manhandable lengths, and then hauled to the site. Uh, there would have been portable mills brought along to be able to, to cut them. But because they were in a hurry, they only cut the logs top and bottom, but didn't square them off in the way we expect to see railway ties today. And they were used for the initial ties to be dropped along the rail grade as the train made its way up and over the hills. The Kettle Valley never made a penny of profit. It was built to head off a disgruntled former CPR executive who was trying to build a line up from the U.S. If the investors knew what they were in for, they wouldn't have tried to stop them. Trains were frozen in all winter, carried away by avalanches, the track was taken out by washouts and so on. In fact, that's why CP finally abandoned that in 1956 after some big washouts. But a train finding its way through to Coquihalla found its way blocked by a snowdrift. So it ran at the snowdrift and got stuck. So he backed up and ran at the snowdrift again and got stuck. So he figured, well, if I just run at it one more time, I'm going to be through. And then the engineer noticed that the light at the front of the train was out. So he said to the fireman, climb through the snow along the board at the side of the locomotive and have a look and see what's wrong with that light. So the uh, fireman climbed along the side of the locomotive, but what he saw were, completely made him forget about the light. A landslide had just taken away the track 
and if the train had run back one more time and charged into the um, snow, it would have gone over. Most of the steel rails have been lifted from the old Kettle Valley. Whole sections of right-of-way have been taken over by the provincial government and are now cycling and hiking trails. Some cyclists organize one to four day trips over the part of the roadbed open to the public. But the peaceful orchard country around Summerland still echoes to the steam whistle and brass bell of the old Shea locomotive. It's not a fast train, but then it never was. In its heyday, the Kettle Valley Express averaged about 20 miles an hour. For Ken Tapping, saving the railway was preserving history. Well, the mandate of the Kettle Valley Railway Heritage Society was to save a piece of the Kettle Valley Railway because of its historical importance and set that small piece of preserve line up as a living reminder of what the Kettle Valley Railway was all about, you know, so that people for these days could ride that train or see that train and get at least in a small way a reminder of what uh, it was like when the KBR was running through this area, an important part of transportation in BC. And the railway, for all its faults, did play an important role in developing a vast area of BC, reaching from the Kootenays in the east to the Fraser Valley in the west. Most important, the part it played in development of the orchards of the Okanagan. David McClellan is with Polona Land and Orchard. Well, primarily, the, the train was the only way to get the product out, of the, out to the marketplace. Our big roads now were dirt roads in those days, one lane only, just strictly dirt, horse and buggy time. Even our sprayers were, were pulled by horse and buggy, and the apples were taken down, uh, literally horse and buggy, down to the docks, loaded onto the barges, they were steamed down to the Penticton where the railhead was. And then from there, that's transported right across Canada. That's how the Okanagan got world famous for its apples. Denise Naherny, BC Orchard Museum. The apples needed to get to the markets quickly. We were competing with the American uh, apples, which perhaps were ripening a little bit sooner than ours. So we had to get to our markets just as well. And the railroad was critical and very important. Although the lushness of the orchards belies it, the Okanagan is in BC's dry belt, and in the early days it was open ranch country, where wild herds of cattle were turned loose to graze on sparse clumps of grass. Lots of sun and little rain make it one of BC's favorite vacation areas. Well, the Okanagan Valley is a very special area. We have the nice sunshine here for so many days. You know, we can go of 40 days without any rain. Uh, so actually our rainfall is very low. We have to irrigate because it is a very dry area. Therefore, the, the fruit grows just wonderfully. Soft fruits grow in the sunny warmth of the Okanagan, but it made its reputation with apples. Okanagan apples sped to the harbor at Vancouver on the Kettle Valley Railway were shipped to Britain and other international markets. Each fall, excursion trains carried apple pickers from eastern Canada and from the west coast to the orchards. They found the apples grew the best, primarily because it was a lack of soil. See, for soft fruits like peaches and pears and such, you need good soil. And that's more in the south of the valley. Here, we have no soil. Well, I shouldn't say that. We may be two inches in places. The rest is rock and dirt, heavy on the rock but that gives us the best apples in the world. Now, you can't tell anybody about this, because that's our secret, why we grow the best in the Okanagan Valley. We're world famous for it. Apple trees like to be watered frequent, but they hate wet feet. They want to drain very, very fast. So that soil gives us that. You add that with our hours of sunshine, our cool nights, nobody can touch us for quality. Tonnage, yeah, they'll knock our socks off. But quality, yeah, they can't touch us. And that's our, that's our secret, why we grow the best. The Kettle Valley only served the southern end of Lake Okanagan. Other communities relied on paddle-wheeled steamboats. The last to enter service was the CPR's SS Sycamus. The Sycamus has been restored and docked at Penticton, where she was met for years by Kettle Valley trains. The Sycamus was taken out of service in 1935. 
She's now a tourist attraction. Marlene Trenholt is administrative coordinator with the Okanagan Marine Museum. The sycamores would leave Penticton early in the morning. 5.30 was the departure time. Sometimes it was a little later, depending on how much they had to load or unload, the number of people getting on, the number of train cars there were to, to service and load onto the vessel. As well, uh, weather conditions would play a, a role in the departure time. It made 14 stops up and down the lake, leaving, leaving Penticton and traveling up to Okanagan Landing, arriving there around noon. And then, of course, the 14 stops on the way back. And it arrived back in Penticton between 8 and 8.30 at night. Again, depending on how many people had gotten on or off at each stop, how much loading and unloading they'd had to do, and weather conditions. I like people to touch the woodwork, to feel the mahogany, to, to look at the, the way things were built in those days. It wasn't built with nails and screws and electric saws and power tools. It was built by hand, with love and care. And that's what we want people to feel when they're here, is that attention to the detail that people made, the moldings and all of the woodwork and the trim and everything were, were very painstakingly put together to present an image that the CPR and the craftsmen that built this vessel wanted to portray. Aboard the Sycamus, a model of the Kettle Valley Railway. The model railway, which is an HO scale of the Kettle Valley Rail Line, is on board the Sycamus for a number of reasons, which have kind of grown over the years. When it was started, it was because there were members of a model railway club that was just forming in the area that were looking for a space to develop their railway. And they came to the Sycamus board saying, you have this huge boat can we use a very small piece of it to meet on and build a small model railway? And it grew from there. The plans grew to make their railway something that was more than just a model train, but to make it a model of the Kettle Valley Line, which was linked to the Sycamuse in many ways and part of the CPR system. So that kind of grew from there. And it has become a major tourist attraction in its own right now and happens to be on board the Sycamus and the two have been together throughout history and it's nice to have them together now in model form on board this vessel. Many of those who ride the Kettle Valley today are seeking to recapture something of their personal past, to renew memories of this extraordinary railway. We bought an orchard at Naramata on top of the cliffs, and the Kettle Valley Railway went past up above, and we used to listen to the whistle, we just loved it. I don't think I ever traveled when the weather was as nice as this, and uh, I can remember a lot of rainy, snow-covered uh, side hills. Uh, it was always in the winter time when I traveled, and uh, I'm really enjoying this because it's just gorgeous. It's a wonderful experience. For the volunteers who saved this portion of the Kettle Valley, seeing the old rolling stock once again climbing up the bench lands is a source of enormous satisfaction. And although the line gave the CPR nothing but headaches over the years. Ken Tapping and others found the company more than willing to keep alive the spirit of the Kettle Valley. The society contacted Canadian Pacific uh, with an idea of trying to save a piece of the line. And we only had about 10 grand saved at the time and so on. Uh, we crossed off all the questionable land and land where the ownership might be disputed and ended up with a stretch from just the south end of the Trout Creek Bridge, the 260 foot high trestle at the southern end of our line, which we definitely want to be part of our railway uh, through to Falder. And Canadian Pacific responded immediately saying, okay, we'll get back to you with the price. We'll instruct our lifting crews to leave that in place. And uh, the lifting crews came and went. And within about two or three months, all that was left of the KVR was at 16 kilometers. And Canadian Pacific never did come back to us with the price. What they did instead was help get us involved in the discussion with the government so that way um, 
there was no danger of the track bed. If the railway project failed or whatever, the track bed would still remain a crown asset and would still be accessible for hiking and biking and so on. But it was wonderful. It saved us a tremendous amount of money and got us off the ground in more ways than I could probably mention. Robert! Now, obviously, no one person can claim credit for what we've done. There's a group of us that can claim credit for what we've done. But to see a chance to have this sort of impact or to save something like this, uh, I don't know the adjective. It's just so fantastic. You know, more people should try it. This railway, despite the generosity of the government, this railway is a very expensive thing to get set up and we've got a long way to go yet. So the story of our railway is financial crisis to financial crisis. And getting started up this year was the usual financial crisis. However, on the first train, going up the valley, smelling the locomotive and seeing it and feeling the heat um, made us feel, yep, it's worth it. We're still here and it's getting better and better. The Kendall Valley is an important remnant of our railway past. It was built against all the rules. When the CPR finally pulled the plug on the Kettle Valley, closed it down, ripped up much of the track, one official said it construction was the greatest blunder in railway history. Well, that may have been the view of the head office. It was a different matter to those people whose lives were daily touched by this incredible railway and who were trying to keep its memory alive. perspective on people and their daily lives. Join Erica M. for an hour of useful and entertaining television. Real Life with Erica M. Next on Life Network. <laughs>